the whole seasonal thing is really just like a kind of lens to sort of view each record through. So we won't, you know, want to autumn themed record we won't necessarily have you know a song about pumpkin patches or whatever but like you know it because you know knowing that it's an autumn themed record you can kind of like i don't know like put your autumn hat on and kind of like view the songs in with that sort of spin on it um and then as well uh on each record we have like uh, a terrestria song so there's like one, two, three so far, and each Terrestria song is an instrumental track that's related to the current season that we're on. Um, so that's kind of like a fun little thing that runs through each you know record and relates directly to the season that we're on. But in general, um, it's kind of just a way to you know to take in the 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 lyrics on the record. You know, like on this newest record there's a lot about you know like loss and regret and change and stuff like that and you know maybe knowing that it's a an autumn themed record you could kind of like view it with that sort of melancholic kind of you know tone that you might have in like the autumn seasons when adam or jake comes to me and they're like okay this song you know this record this is an autumn record you know um that it, that helps me as a musical entity to like kind of like come up with stuff and like you know whether it's recurring musical themes or whatever that you know might to me have like a tinge of like an autumn sort of thing or a summer or a sp spring or whatever you know there's a lot of things that retain to each season that kind of come up in the writing process that i feel kind of are relatable directly relatable maybe lyrically but we're not looking uh directly at the season per se itself. There's so many things that correlate to each season that relates to our lives, relates to the coming and going of all experiences. So I think it adds just a huge dynamic and space when he's just kind of like translating the emotion of the season through music or we're translating the emotion through lyrics. So it kind of like adds like a real uh, interesting and sturdy foundation that we can like navigate through. But there yeah. was like this giant solar, solar flare, flare, yeah, solar flare thing that kind of wiped out, wiped light, out the planet life yeah. at the end of the first record. On the second record, basically, um, everyone's kind of gone off into these like sort of crevices in the earth because the planet is no longer inhabitable and by water. There's like no water on the planet yeah. whatsoever. But on the third record, on this newest one, then um, there's this. Um, several thousand year old sentient being he's like the last remaining life form person on planet earth who's supposed to have this immortality to him he's the guy on the front of the record and he's been alive and alone for thousands and thousands of years so far away from you know who he once was as a human being and i guess the newest record is kind of just like a collection of like his memories and stories and regrets he's sort of like kind of carrying like the the weight of the entire planet's memories on, on him, with him, and he kind of lives through those experiences in a way. Finally, sweet release of death at the end of this last record, and yeah. kind of... In order to release himself of those experiences and the weight of his existence. <laughs> Next record, there's nobody nobody left, so kind of wondering how the narrative's going to work on that one, because there's no real story to tell. We've already been talking about... Um, about the the winter record nothing's been really been written yet but it might end up being a I don't want to say like a noisier or more gritty release but I guess that would probably be like the the thing that we you know what we've discussed so far since I feel like on this record people have kind of you know oh well, that the saxophone you know if that's the sax band or this or that and I feel like at this point people are kind of expecting us to sort of just like keep the ball rolling in that direction and kind of like, you know, go the way that like a, like a Mastodon did where like, you know, after Crack the Sky, you know, they, they started having like more and more songs with clean singing and got more of like a mainstream kind of thing going on. And I feel like at this point, people are sort of expecting that from us. But I think if, with everything we've talked about so far, um, we've kind of been thinking that the, the winter record might end up being like one of our more uh, just disgusting records, I guess. And nasty. Nas kind of just a nastier sounding. record, you know, to yeah. kind of close out the seasonal thing. Um, but it's all just talk at this point. We, we don't really know yet. Yeah. I mean, we definitely didn't want to be kind of like pigeonholed as the sax band. And I think that the amount of sax that's on the record and like the context of it, at least from, from my point of view, um, I think that we did it in a way where it's not like, boom, here's the sax part that like we just threw into the song because like we're going to get that sax cred, you know what I mean? Like it was a super 
kind of natural thing. Like we became friends with a guy who recorded sax on the record. He was a friend of mine. I recorded one of his bands a while ago. Um, and he was like, Hey man, you know, if you ever, I'm going to school for, you know, music performance and stuff. If you guys ever need anyone to play sax on your record, like, just let me know, you know? And, and I was like, I'm never going to do that. Never going to be that band, you know? And like started writing these songs and I was just like, probably sound cool with a sax in this part. Cause I wrote it with these like big open sections where like, you could either like play a guitar solo that no one wants to hear because it's way too long or you know you could you know just add layers upon layers of atmosphere and just totally strip the part out but like a lot of the parts where sax got added were just these big kind of open sections where just i kind of just heard like a sax or a trumpet or something like in those sections so i feel like all the parts on the record where there is sax um it was like something that sort of happened naturally and it wasn't something that you know, was forced for that kind of like, look how forward thinking we are. We put a saxophone on a death metal record. Um, what you heard about us not wanting to be the sax man is totally true. And I think we achieved it sort of, but we definitely do a lot of times see people like, oh, you're the band with the sax. That's bound to happen though. I mean, you put a, a brass instrument or a woodwind instrument on a death metal record, you know, a lot of people that are like not as well versed in like, other bands that may have done that, of course, it's going to blow their minds. You know what I mean? Because it's like, wow, I've never heard of that. It's like they've never listened to like, you know, Eson, obviously, or Flesh Rod, or even, you know, the Faceless. I think there was a variation before, uh, before the one that's on the album that was a little more extreme for a silent life of, of sax part. And I was like, whoa, I was like, this is insanely cool. You know, and I think the other thing to that we wanted to keep in mind for the sax parts on this record um, were that we didn't want to have like, crazy freak out sax parts like we wanted to have like more one section where he kind of does the like crazy you know sax thing but we wanted it to be like very much like another melodic instrument on the record not just like a chaotic textural thing you know i had zach come over to my place i have like a little recording set up in my house and like basically just gave him the part and was just like do what you think sounds cool and he like would lay stuff down and most of what you heard on the record is like pretty much what he came over to my place and track but yeah the silent life was the first thing that he did um, and I sent it to the guys and everyone was just like instantly down with it. Like just from the get go of hearing, it, you know, having him suggest there or the band proposing it, I was excited about it. And I thought it really went well with the theme. The first song on the record um, starts with this kind of like Rhodes piano sort of thing with, um, with this one chord progression. The last song begins with the same exact chord progression, but transposed to a guitar. That same chord progression uh, comes back in Terrestria 3. Um, on the acoustic guitar, but it's played in different intervals. So it's like that whole like um, doom, 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 doom. That, You know that the the way that that record starts the way the record starts ends and then in the middle there It's the same um, It's the same kind of like melody um, on every record We have the terrestria and like that same melody runs through each song um, our first record starts with uh, the terrestrial one which has this one melody and that same melody it's less obvious in Terrestria 2 on our last record, um, but then the same melody comes back again on this record in Terrestria 3. So, um, so yeah, I mean, but the most obvious glaring examples of like repeating motifs would be on the first track on this record and the last track. Um, like literally both of those songs start the same exact way, but on different instruments. So I'm, I'm like a huge fan of like bands that use that because you you hear it you hear that come back and you're just like instantly aware of like what record you're listening to and i don't think that like because obviously like pink floyd you know the masters of that like when you hear that like on the wall when you hear dun, 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 you know what you're listening to you know and that comes back all over the place on that record whether it's through a vocal line or a guitar line or a bass line um same thing with like the delayed guitars that dun, 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 dun. that's like a total like oh well listening to the wall you know what i mean i've just always been a big fan of like bands that do that so we tr we try to do it on on this record and you know while we're not as good at it as pink floyd are obviously um i think you know we ha we had some somewhat of a success with it because um i always like records that are kind of connected from start to end you know just like the wall you know and it starts and ends with a phrase that's broken up you know it starts with uh isn't this where and then it ends with we came in and then it's just like an endless cycle so I'm a big fan of stuff like that thanks to certain trends certain recent trends in heavy music having a clean but distorted guitar tone kind of gets pigeonholed with the, the D word the the, 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 the word in the death metal community people will hear it and they'll 
kind of be like, oh, that's kind of gen- genty or whatever, you know, that's like not at all what I've ever gone for. It's just like, I understand why they think that, but it's like, I mean, we use, we're using all like real, we're not using Axe FX or Kempers in the studio. We're using like all real, like sick, badass amps, you know, with real pedals, you know, it's like, it's real shit.